Thanks very much. Um, in the first couple of minutes, I'm going to walk you through a whole bunch of slides that I don't have time to speak to, because I will speak the time. But briefly, these cover the first four reports in our series of five. And I do want to tell you about them, because they provide important context for the discussion tonight about economic issues. Notably, one of the justifications for Site C, despite the high level of environmental impacts that it will have, was that it was determined to be the least cost option uh, at the time the assessment was done and then approval was given. Now, I wanted to underscore something that the joint review panel didn't have time to look at, so you can keep scrolling through these um, and move through to slide 16. I'll just briefly summarize a couple of key findings in the reports. The first is that the joint review panel did have a somewhat constrained mandate. For example, they could not, not look at the uh, relative scale of the impacts of Site C versus other large projects in Canada. So that's one analysis we did. We compared the number of environmental effects that were uh, identified by the joint review panel to all other projects that had undergone a review under the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act. And what we found Again, and not a finding included in the Joint Review Panel's report, was that Site C had an unprecedented level of environmental effects, the highest number of significant adverse environmental effects for any project ever approved under the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act. Now, uh, this is, might be surprising if you don't know that valley. It's an extraordinary valley. It plays a very important role in the ecology of that region and indeed the entire Mackenzie Basin. So, without going into the details, I want to under, simply underscore what was said by Councillor Doki earlier, that this is a, a place of tremendous importance ecologically for the province, indeed the country. The other key point I'll underscore before moving on to the economics is the greenhouse gas emissions analysis. <coughs> so, uh, most people in the room probably know that construction of a dam filling a reservoir generates emissions. Uh, not all of us uh, know how much. So the estimates range between, well, there are different estimates, but between sort of five and seven or eight um, metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. Uh, this is equivalent to about uh, 50,000 new cars on BC's roads every year. Doesn't sound like a lot, uh, and it's not a lot compared to some other ways of generating electricity, but it's more than zero. And all those emissions peak in the early years following the um, completion of the dam and the filling of the reservoir. Uh, and that peak is significant, and it's occurring precisely at a time when we're trying to reduce our emissions. So that didn't get taken into account, uh, but should have, and it, it underscores the point that this project is not as clean and green as is commonly understood. Now, one might still argue that we can justify such a project with its unprecedented environmental impacts if it is indeed the least cost option. But our research uh, indicates that it's not, and here we'll get to the economics report. So it's a 160-page report. It's got 60-odd figures and tables and 300 footnotes. So I cannot, it took us hundreds of hours to put it together, so I can't do it justice. I'll just mention a few points and I'll cite our website at the end. The first point is, as mentioned earlier, the significant decline in load forecasts. Next. So uh, the Green Line 2012 load forecast, 2016 load forecast, these are BC Hydro's forecast, these are the actuals. We did, we, we did an analysis a significant part of the report is simply analysis of the past 30 years of BC Hydro's demand forecasting. So and we established that they uh, overestimated future demand in 85% of the cases. Next. Um, that is the forecast they provided in 1981 when they applied to build Site C. These are the actuals. So they predicted demand would double in about 10 years or nearly double. We have still not reached the, that level of predicted demand today. So there then uh, uh, is the possibility, and perhaps even a robust hypothesis, that the current demand forecasts are themselves overestimates. Next. These are the demand forecasts from the past few years. Now, we put together two very different sources of data, the 2013 IRP, the Integrated Resource Plan, and the 2016 Revenue Requirements Application, the RRA, currently under review by the BC Utilities Commission. So and tens of thousands of new documentation coming out as part of that. So we have extracted a lot of these numbers from those two sources in case you're interested. But to make a long story short, look at the curve here. So we see a very distinct increase in predicted demand in 2012-2013 when the decision to build Site C was actually being made. And the demand forecasts have since declined. These are actuals. This is what we're actually consuming. These are the predictions. 
So um, these, this is a very material uh, issue for the calculation of the economic impacts of building Site C. Next. If demand uh, is indeed uh, predicted to fall, um, or if, sorry, if demand forecasts are now lower, and they indeed are, according to BC Hydro's own numbers, what this means is that Site C will be 100% surplus upon commissioning, and it will remain surplus for several years, according to BC Hydro's uh, forecast right now, probably about eight years. But if those forecasts are an optimistic overestimate, that surplus could persist much longer. Next. Okay, so if we assume that indeed uh, the forecasts are accurate, what we see is the percent of Site C energy that's surplus coming down to zero, commissioning in 2024, coming down to zero in about 2032, but there are losses precisely for the reasons that Owen outlined. We need to sell it somewhere. We would need to sell it at, lo at a significant loss. And we calculated that loss at uh, close to $1 billion, simply from this, um, this, this gap, if you like, between when the project is built and when the energy is needed. So next. Simultaneously, the prices of the alternatives have dropped substantially. Uh, Paul, the next speaker, will, of course, know more about this than I do. But next, very briefly. So this is a range of forecasts for wind prices from a variety of international authorities, like Bloomberg, the International Renewable Energy Agency. The top line, okay, this straight line, that was BC Hydro's assumption, okay, that wind power prices wouldn't drop in 2013. But they have. They've dropped about 20% on average, and they are predicted to drop by 20% more. Now, this is a... This poses then an interesting counterfactual uh, question, which academics have the privilege of kind of uh, dabbling in, which is, were we to be approving or debating the approval of Site C today, and were we to compare Site C to an alternative portfolio, as BC Hydro did at the time, consisting of, for example, wind and energy conservation, what would the price difference be today? And that price difference is now very substantial, such that Site C would not have been chosen as the option. It is now clear that the cheaper option for the province would have been to choose a portfolio with wind power, pump storage, some energy conservation, and perhaps some gas just for peaking requirements. Next. Okay. But instead of that, what we have is um, a situation where the province is indeed committed to Site C. Uh, one of the consequences of that, I'll briefly mention, reductions in energy conservation. I think Owen mentioned this. Next. So, and this came out of the analysis of the 2016 and 27 data released through the BC Utilities Commission. So this is the, the basically DSM is demand side management, which you can colloquially understand as energy conservation. RRA is the regulatory process um, underway with the BC Utilities Commission. So basically, to make, to make it simple, demand side management goes to zero, meaning cutting back on energy conservation, which only costs about a third as much as the um, electricity generated from Site C. So in a context where you have a surplus, it makes sense from a narrow perspective to cut back on conservation initiatives because you do want everyone to consume more, so they soak up more of your surplus and they pay you more. Does this make sense under the spirit of the Clean Energy Act? Does this make sense for consumers? No. Important debate. So there are a couple of the other key points that came out of our analysis, and here I'll briefly close. How much time do I have left? Okay. Well. So 80 pages of the report is about the point of the return analysis. We did 10 scenarios with three sub-scenarios each, low, medium, high, so 30 scenarios, to uh, varying all the variables you would expect and taking into account cancellation costs, demobilization costs, site maintenance costs, etc. So the sum total of that analysis is that under all of the scenarios, it would actually be cheaper to cancel or suspend the project rather than continue. Uh, suspension being slightly more, more advantageous by about $350 million. Now, this is a snapshot in time. All Any of these variables could change, right? But at this point in time, we took like, the date June 30th, 2017. From a business case perspective, it would seem, on the basis of the publicly available data, to make sense to at least suspend the project, thereby deferring the construction costs. And if you bring the construction back online, you're closer to the point when the energy is needed, right? That's why suspension actually makes uh, good business sense. But during that time of suspension, refer to the BC Utilities Commission for a full and thorough review, because of course we don't have access to all the data that they would have access to, and they'd be able to do an even more uh, comprehensive analysis. So that's why the recommendation of our report was at this juncture, 
Given the significant change in the underlying conditions, that is the future predicted demand, export prices, costs of alternatives, that it makes sense for the BC Utility Commission to uh, do that analysis. So I believe I'm nearly out of time. So I'll simply uh, finish by just talking a little bit about our team. So it also includes Dr. Gordon Christie, who's a professor of law at uh, UBC, Indigenous Legal Studies, and two energy consultants who have uh, several decades of experience, uh, including acting as expert <coughs> witness before utilities boards and regulatory tribunals in multiple jurisdictions in Canada and the US. And you can find out more about us on our website, which is watergovernance.ca forward slash projects forward slash site C. The five reports are there and um, on all of the data sources are actually hyperlinked in the document. So we really welcome feedback on our methods and analysis and, and uh, look forward to the debate that the report will stimulate. So thank you very much.